What's up guys, and welcome back to- oh wait, I don't have an intro I usually say. Uh, well, anyways, today we're looking at Halloween, directed by John Carpenter, who competes with Pete Docter as my favorite director. Makes sense, their genres are pretty similar. Halloween was Carpenter's third movie, after Dark Star and Assault on Precinct 13, both of which were initial failures, but have since received quite a bit of praise, especially Assault on Precinct 13, which is now his most well-reviewed movie, right next to Halloween. Isn't it funny how movies can just be- Reevaluated and suddenly deemed good. Like the critics just woke up on a different side of the bed and were like, You know, when I really look at the big picture, I can appreciate what the director was trying. This stupid son of a bitch can't even develop characters right. My god, he's such a mother. I think his pacing is really well, and I think he does a good job flushing out the story. This thing is edited like a fing middle school video project. Halloween is best known for being the introduction of Michael Myers, one of the horror genre's unofficial but also kind of official mascots, right alongside Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger. The thing all three of these characters have in common is their ability to go beyond the niche world of horror. Even if you've never seen a horror movie, you've no doubt seen one of, if not all of these three characters at some point in your life. They're pop culture icons, your three-year-old child can mention how much they love Michael Myers and you'll only be 90% concerned as opposed to them mentioning some random horror movie villain you've never heard of. But let's go into how this thing was made. Well, after seeing Assault on Precinct 13, producers Erwin Yablons and Mustafa Akkad pitched Carpenter the idea of a psychopath stalking babysitters, they would call it, The Babysitter Murders. The name was quickly changed to Halloween, though, a name suggested by Erwin Yablons, because... Look, I just thought that name could carry 12 more sequels better, okay? The movie also wasn't originally supposed to take place on Halloween night, that was a change Carpenter made. I think. It was either him or Yablons that made the change, I found several different articles each saying different things. I think it probably came from Carpenter, but just know I can't be 100% positive on that. The screenplay was written in only 10 days, which is... Not a lot of time to write a screenplay. But on a budget of only $300,000 and a limited time frame to get the movie done, things had to move pretty quickly. Carpenter got Deborah Hill to co-write the screenplay with him and remember her name because she was just as big of an influence in this movie's production as he was. The two of them took turns passing over the script, each adding and removing things until they settled on the finished product. Celtic traditions like the Festival of Samhain were big influences in the writer's room, even though it's not mentioned in the actual movie, though they do touch on that more in Halloween 2. Deborah Hill, who had actually been a babysitter as a teenager, helped a lot with those scenes. Um, no, 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 no. When I was attacked by a serial killer in high school, his stabs were much more violent and quick, you know, kind of like this, and he kind of held the knife more like this in his right hand. So go ahead and change that. Carpenter was also inspired by haunted house stories most small towns have when it came to setting up the character of Michael Myers, which is so true, by the way. Every freaking small town has this insane legend, like, right there. In that house, a man ripped his wife's brains out and used parts of it to hold together the studs in the walls in place of nails or screws. And he also used her bones as firewood. Legend has it that the bones are still in the fireplace to this day. I'm a realtor. I was in that house yesterday. I'm trying to sell it. There was nothing in there. Shut up. When it came time for casting, Peter Cushing was offered the role of Dr. Loomis, one of the film's main characters, but he turned it down due to the low salary. Christopher Lee, who played Dracula in... Dracula also turned down the role, and so it eventually fell to Donald Pleasance, who only accepted the role because his daughter liked Carpenter's score on Assault on Precinct 13. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this movie. I don't understand it. I don't understand the part I'm playing. But the only reason I'm here to do this is because my daughter is in a rock and roll band in England, and she liked the music to assault on Precinct 13. There you go. That was it. That was my recommendation. Pleasance was the most experienced person on the film set, and even though he didn't have confidence in the film or John Carpenter... I believe people are behaving in a way in which they couldn't possibly in real life behave. And that's always difficult, because if you're one of the people, then you're the one who's going to look like an idiot. He still stayed professional on set and came around to the movie once it became successful. He kind of, in an interview with the BBC, kind of badmouthed me from on the set, but that all went away when the movie was successful. Was it's funny say. how that works. The role of Laurie Strode, the film's main character, was originally supposed to go to Annie Lockhart, who was the actress Carpenter wanted, but she was too busy, so the role ended up going to Jamie Lee Curtis, who was just starting out her career at that time. She didn't even want the main part originally, since she felt she didn't align with the quiet character of Laurie Strode, since she was more of a smart aleck and a cheerleader in high school, but she she auditioned for the part, Carpenter was impressed, and she was hired. Playing Michael Myers was Nick Castle, one of Carpenter's friends from film school. For a measly $25 a day, he just had to stand and... 
do nothing, just stand and occasionally kill people. Plus he directed Major Pain, so he's immediately good in my book. Once all that was settled, time for filming. Like I said earlier, they only had $300,000 to work with. For comparison, Deadpool and Wolverine, when you had the marketing budget, cost $300 million. Filming took 20 days, and most of the movie was filmed using the new Panaglide, that I'm not knowledgeable enough on to completely know all about it, I just know it allowed them to create smoother shots and was easier to move around in in tight spaces with. After test screening the almost finished movie to a test audience, nobody found it scary. So Carpenter had only one option, save it with the music! In only three days, he had the entire score written, with the iconic Halloween theme being written in just an hour, my god, I can't even make breakfast and finish it in an hour, and John Carpenter wrote a whole ass song in that time? But he lucked out, because he ended up saving it with the music! Now, contrary to what you might think, the movie actually wasn't a super big hit right away. Slowly but surely, the movie expanded its release in more and more theaters, until eventually it became the success story everyone knows today. Now, funnily enough, when it first came out, it wasn't super well-reviewed by critics. Pauline Keel, I think? from The New Yorker wrote, Carpenter doesn't seem to have any life outside the movies. God damn, woman, maybe you're the one who needs a life. One thing I've learned from all the research I've done for all these movies I've covered are critics are just mean. Like, I don't like critics anyways, but jeez, this kind of stuff just reaffirms my feelings. You'd be shocked at how mean they can get sometimes. But Halloween was very quickly reevaluated by critics, and now is universally praised, considered one of the greatest horror movies of all time, and now all those critics and John Carpenter can move on and be friends, right? I, I just want to spend five minutes with each one in a room, a locked room, just the two of us. Five minutes is all I ask, and then I'll be happy. God damn it, I love John Carpenter. Anyways, on a budget of $300,000, 70 million, what a payday. And when producers get a payday like that, sequels are inevitable. Despite not having any good ideas for a sequel, Carpenter would be forced into writing Halloween 2 three years later, which was not as well received because it's the same as the first movie, basically just worse. After that, the franchise kept throwing random shit at the wall just seeing what sticks. A random third movie that takes place in an entirely different universe? Sure! Michael's back, but this time he's after his niece? Sure, f*** it. Michael's being controlled by a cult called the Foreign Cult? Why not? White Trash Rob Zombie remake that has dialogue that sounds like it was pulled from a dead raccoon's body? Yes, please. Maybe I'll choke the chicken, purge my snorkel all over them flappy ass tits. And a nice trilogy that's returned to form just for good measure. Now, I'm just gonna be looking at the first movie for right now. I'll cover the rest eventually, but 13 movies is a lot of movies, and I don't want to be looking at the same franchise for several months in a row. I need variety. Bitch, I will crawl over there, and I will scum the shit out of you! Shut up, Ronnie, I don't like your movie anyways. Yeah, cry me a river. Anyways, with all that being said, turn off the lights, or don't, it might hurt your eyes. Get under the blankets, or don't, you might get too hot. And make some popcorn! Actually, don't, because the crunching sound will make it too hard to hear anything. Anyways, do whatever you want, here we go. Also, just a quick disclaimer, this movie's not very bloody. Sure, the sequels amped up the kills, but this first one relies more on suspense rather than blood, so a few kills there are are pretty much bloodless. Uh, still though, it is a horror movie, so if you scare easily or don't like that kind of stuff, maybe skip over this episode, don't worry, there's plenty more for you to watch, like when I covered miracle dogs and wanted to die. Even though I'll probably end up just making stupid jokes and undoing all the tension the movie builds up. But for those of you brave enough to stick around, let's go. So the movie starts with the sick-ass opening of a pumpkin that inches closer and closer as the credits play, and eventually it reveals Michael holding a knife. See, there's the head and there's the knife. Pretty cool. We also get our first taste of John Carpenter's phenomenal Halloween theme. <laughs> After this, we're catapulted into Halloween night, 1963. A first-person POV shows us this chick and her boyfriend swapping DNA on the couch before they decide to go upstairs and I guess have sex, even though this guy comes down like a minute later. Was that just a practice session seeing how quickly they could undress? Well, regardless, we follow this person up the stairs, they mask up with this clown mask on the floor, and pff, yeah, just chill out topless in your bedroom with the door open while your six-year-old brother is home. It's fine, he definitely won't be traumatized. He's actually not, in fact, he ain't playing no games and he kills his sister, though we don't get to see it, we just know he's finished when she falls down like a Santa Claus inflatable the day after Christmas. After that, might as well just walk outside before the rotting smell starts setting in and his parents conveniently get home right then. They take off his mask and then all three of them just kind of stand there. And stand there and stand there- somebody take that bloody knife out of his hand! So now we're in 1978, so 15 years later, and we see Michael's doctor, Sam Loomis, driving with Nurse Mary in Chambers. They're on their way to transfer Michael someplace else, but it looks like all the patients didn't get the memo that it was just Michael going. Loomis goes up to the front gate, which leaves Mary in exposed to creepy men climbing up onto the car like freaking spiders. I know a lot of people probably find this shot creepy, but I think it's funny how- 
fucking stupid he looks. Like, it would be more on brand for Michael to do it slower, more discreet, but nope, just launch your full body weight right up there. He attacks her, she jumps out of the car, he jumps in in another goofy looking scene, and what do you make of this, Loomis? He's gone. He's gone from here. The evil is gone. Yeah, he is no longer here, which by definition does indeed mean... He's, He's gone. gone. We'll check in on him later, but for now, let's go back to Michael's hometown where we meet the film's main character, Laurie Strode. We follow her on her walk home from school, but her dad asked her to drop a key off at the Myers house first, which is now abandoned. This is how production actually found the house, so earlier on in the movie, they had to clean it up and whitewash it for those opening scenes. So when that polished earlier shot that you saw at the beginning of the movie, this is what the house looked like. She drops the key off, but uh-oh, looks like somebody's watching you, Lori. Michael's a little bit shy, though, so for right now, he'll just watch from a distance as he builds up the courage to talk to you. We finally check back in with Loomis, and he's pissed nobody listened to him, and he's venting his frustrations to this fellow doctor. This guy, Dr. Witt, actually reappears in this spectacularly bad Halloween 6. Now, you're probably wondering, do they set up his character here for that movie? Nope, he appears for like a minute, never to be heard from again. Loomis is heading for Haddonfield, since he knows Michael isn't exactly the most unpredictable person there is. While Lori's in class, she sees more of Michael, but don't worry, as soon as he notices her, he decides to stay out of the way, don't want to freak her out or anything. We meet this kid, Tommy Doyle, who Lori's babysitting tonight, and who was with her on her walk to school earlier. These free kids are mean, though, and make him smash his pumpkin. Jerk move, but also, why are you carrying that thing around anyways? He has no backpack, so do you keep all your school supplies in there? Well, your teacher asks you for your math work, and you're like, Just a minute. Um, nope, no pencil sharpener, uh, eraser... Oh, here it is. Now one of the bullies runs off and, hey, no running, you hear me? Michael doesn't get an answer, but he doesn't have time for that kid. He's focused on Tommy right now. Now it might look like Michael is stalking him in a creepy way, but he's actually just making sure he gets home safe. Yeah, that's it. What a good Samaritan you are, Michael. We also get another check-in on Loomis, who's calling the police to warn them, but nobody's taking him seriously. That's when he notices a truck that went off the road, and he finds Michael's sanitarium clothes. So, what's he wearing? Probably the coveralls he stole from this guy, but nobody ever gives him the credit for giving Michael his trademark outfit. Poor guy. So, back to Lori, she's walking home from her school, when, alright, Michael, here's your chance. Just say hi to her and her friends, and, oh, I can't do it, I'm too scared. Lori's friends have some not-kind words for him, though. Hey, jerk! Lady, he wasn't even going that fast. That's like how fast I go around neighborhoods. That's the speed limit. I hope. Michael stops for a moment, though. Yeah, sorry, Lori. Your friend's gotta go. But he can't kill them now. He's gotta wait until he can get the jump on them first. One of Lori's friends goes home, and they actually see Michael again, but when her other friend goes to beat the shit out of him, he's gone. Everyone just thinks Lori's crazy, and maybe they're right. Later on, Lori's staring out her bedroom window, and she sees Michael, but then without looking away, he vanishes. She acts so shocked that he disappeared, too. Like, didn't you see him walk away? The phone rings, and nobody answers, but the second time it's revealed to just be her friend Annie. Apparently, she was just eating. Annie, I think you're just a little prankster, is what I think, because you still could've talked of food in your mouth. I know it sound like this, but you could do it. So Lori goes outside to meet up with Annie, and we see Loomis go to the cemetery, and he discovers Michael's sister's tombstone is missing. What do you have to say about that? He came home. I mean, you can't guarantee it was him, but sure, let's just say that. So Lori and Annie are smoking weed when Michael starts following them. He follows them for quite a while until they notice the alarm going off at the hardware store. We meet Sheriff Brackett, who is Annie's dad, and he lets us know that someone stole a Halloween mask from the hardware store. And that mask, of course, is the iconic Michael Myers mask. Production didn't have a lot of budget, so makeup designer Tommy Lee Wallace went down to the store, bought several masks. One of them was a Captain Kirk mask, in air quotes, because... I don't see the resemblance. If he died, was left to rot for a week, and then hit with a frying pan, then it would make more sense. He took that mask, widened the eye holes, dyed the hair and skin, shaved the sideburns, and boom, Michael Myers mask. Soak it up while you can, because later on, you're gonna miss that mask. So it's finally nighttime, Lori arrives at Tommy's house, but Michael's there too, but who cares about him? Let's check back on Loomis. He finally got a hold of the sheriff, and they're chilling out in the Myers house while Loomis gives an excellent speech about Michael. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face. And... Donald Pleasance's acting is truly one of the movie's biggest strengths. Even John Carpenter was impressed by his ability to make the audience instantly hooked on whatever he says. It's just he, you I believe you. everything he says. I was, I'm just a big fan of his since I was a kid, and, and after this movie. So we check in on Annie. She's babysitting this other girl, Lindsay Wallace. She's in, like, this weird position that makes it look like she's dead for the first couple shots she's in, but I assure you she's not. Now back at Tommy's house, he sees Michael's shadow and gets all worked up, but Lord doesn't give two shits about your crazy fantasy kid, now shut up so I can talk to my friend who's gonna die later. Annie hangs up on Lori, then she spills butter on her shirt. Of course, spilled a single droplet of butter on my shirt, but her strapped down to my underwear. I think Michael just hates naked people if you want to live around him. 
Don't be naked. So Annie goes to this creepy laundry room that's separate from the rest of the house for some reason until she locks herself inside. How do you do that? I honestly think Annie just has a dying fetish. Oh no, I just locked the door. Oh no, I just lost the keys underneath the door. Oh my god, there's a serial killer in the neighborhood targeting teenage girls! Oh my goodness, I'm screaming really loudly so he'll notice me! Eventually, Lindsay finds her and gets her unstuck, but that's only because Paul called, who I guess is Andy's boyfriend. But you better watch it, Annie, because Michael's in the back, and he still hasn't forgotten about what you did to him earlier. Lindsay wants to go f*** Paul, so might as well drop the stupid child off at Lori's for her to deal with. She goes to the car, but it's locked, so she goes back to get the keys, but... Oop, did you catch it? Door was unlocked. She didn't unlock it. Windows fogged up. I think that means there's a Mikey in that car. He strangles her for a bit before deciding to put her out of her misery by doing a clean throat slit across, well, the throat. Nice kill, but could you not make those faces, like, ever? Even when you're dying, just stop, like, just stop, stop, stop it, stop it. Back at Lori's personal hell, Tommy decides to scare Lindsay, but he sees Michael carrying Annie's body like they just got married. He freaks out, but when Lori goes over, nothing. Also, our routinely check in with Loomis, some kids dare each other to go to the Myers house, and he traumatizes them. Hey, Lonnie, get your ass away from there. I love the little smile he does at the end. You can tell that's the most alive he's felt in like 30 years. So remember the third girl we saw earlier, Linda? Well, she's arrived at Lindsay's house with her boyfriend Bob, who looks like the most Bob Bob to ever Bob. They're drinking in his van and going over their plan to f**k, I guess. Then you rip my clothes off, then we rip Lindsay's clothes off. Yeah, I think I got it. Um, Bob? Lindsay is like, eight? That Bob? I'm uncomfortable, Bob. That, that, that Bob? Do you want to explain anything, Bob? Oh, no, we're seriously just going to ignore that and pretend like it's not a bigger deal? Uh, okay. Whatever, Bob. You're the type of person to just leave your car door wide open, so I guess I should have seen this coming. They start making out on the couch and naked people and people who don't close their car doors. Those are the two things Michael hates, Paul. And you are one of those things, and about to be both. Once they find out they have the house to themselves, they go upstairs and get it on! And judging by your position, Paul, I'd say either the bed or Lindsay's five is getting an awesome f***ing. Once they're done, Linda tells him to go get a beer. Got that, Bob? Yeah. And Linda, you're gonna lay in bed and give yourself cancer, got that? Yeah. While Bob's in the kitchen getting the beers, Michael appears, and if you just hadn't left your car door open, Bob, that's all you had to do. But nope, instead Michael pins into the wall with a single knife stab. It's a nice enough kill, Michael, but not exactly pretty, so you maybe want to quit tilting your head over there like you just painted a Leonardo da Vinci painting? Michael shows up wearing a ghost sheet, but Linda thinks it's Bob with her beer. My god, is that all you ever think about, beer? Yeah. Well, if you want Michael to walk all the way across that big-ass room, you're gonna need some serious leverage. See anything you like? Michael does indeed see something he likes, but it's not those, it's fresh meat. Eventually she gets pissed off and goes to call Lori, but no, I'm gonna call her, not you! Okay, Michael. Just tell her you like her. That's all you gotta do. Simple, simple, I can't do it. Instead, he stands there probably blushing underneath the mask until she hangs up on him. Back to Loomisville, he just now notices the car Michael stole across the street and starts running all over the neighborhood looking for him. Meanwhile, Lori decides she's had enough shenanigans and walks across the street to check on her friends. No one answers the front door, so she just lets herself in for the side door left open. She sees a light on upstairs, and when she opens it, boom, Michael's a prize, just for you, Lori. And if you back up right there, boom, another one. And if you just go right there, perfect, walla bam. Now, instead of of reacting with glee to the surprises Michael worked so hard to set up, she freaks out and cries, which pisses him off, so you know what, Lori? I loved you, I tried so hard to confess my feelings to you, I even created this fun display of dead bodies for you, but since you hate them, you must die now. He grazes her arm, she falls down the stairs, and off we go into the film's finale. He busts through a kitchen door, chases her across the street, and tries to get the jump on her when she's hiding, but unfortunately it's hard to see in that mask and with all the lights off, and she stabs him in the neck with a knitting needle. It knocks him down to the ground and leaves a permanent mark you would see on the mask 40 years later in the trilogy. She goes to check on the kids she locked in the bedroom, but Michael's back for seconds. I guess he shouldn't have cooked such delicious firsts, Lori. Anyways, get yourself in that closet. She's actually pretty smart. She opens the balcony window to trick him into thinking she's jumped out, but Michael's a lot of things. Dumb isn't one of them. Or at least not always. He finds her in the closet and goes into full-on rage mode. He obliterates that closet door. He is pissed. She's more scared than pissed, but she still manages to grab a hanger from the floor and stabs him in the eye with it. Oh god, that must hurt. She tells the kids to go get help, and luckily they do, in the form of alerting Loomis about the boogeyman. Now, once again, Lori, you made the mistake of making that second fight too enjoyable, so now Michael's back for thirds. He starts strangling her just as Loomis shows up, but she's able to take off his mask, and we get just a glimpse of his true face. It's really normal, which was an excellent decision. There's something unsettling about seeing just 
a young man underneath the mask. Well, like I've said several times, Michael was played by Ned Castle throughout the movie, and this shot, Michael was played by Tony Moran, but that doesn't stop him from acting like he carried the whole movie. Yeah, Tony Moran isn't exactly the nicest person out there, and I don't really like him, but hey, for this, like, three-second shot, he did fine enough. Loomis shoots Michael off the balcony, but when he goes to check, he's gone? Sequel? Actually, this was supposed to be it. Carpenter originally never wanted a sequel. The sending was just supposed to be scary and imply you can't kill the boogeyman and to make audiences uncomfortable. I still feel this didn't need to have a sequel. And I think it's an excellent ending, especially with the shots of all the locations we've seen so far with Michael's breathing implying he could be anywhere at any time. And with that, the end. So I mean... What is there to say? It's a horror classic, a cinematic classic, we wouldn't have the horror genre as we know it today without Halloween. So maybe you hate it because of that, I don't know. It's great at building suspense, making the audience uncomfortable, and getting you attached to the characters in such a short amount of time. And it should be noted, if you want the true experience, you should watch the full movie. All three of those things are mostly lost when I cut out so much of the film. I say this about every movie I cover, but it's especially true with this one. On the Zacker Attacker Movie Raider, a very sought after 9.5 out of 10. Maybe my only complaint with it is that the first viewing is definitely the most effective since that creates the most suspense. When you watch it again, you already know it's gonna happen, so a lot of the suspense is lost, at least for me. Of course, I'm the type of person who thinks a movie I've already seen before will somehow end differently each time I watch it, so I'm surprised I haven't had that happen with this movie. And of course, that's only a personal complaint. Obviously, you can't blame John Carpenter for that. He can't erase your memory each time you finish the movie, so I didn't take away any points for that. But this is one of the few movies where I don't have really anything wrong with it. There's nothing I would really change or do differently. Everything works out so perfectly to create one of the best horror films ever made, in my opinion, and my personal favorite horror movie, and hell, one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh, it's okay, Barnyard. You'll always have a special place in my heart. I really don't even know what I was expecting from you.